Perfect. Well, welcome everybody to Under the Hat this week. Um, as always, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Robert K. Winters, more commonly known as Dr. Bob or the Confidence Doctor. Um, mm. We've got a great session today talking about the perception of pressure. A fascinating topic, Doc. But first of all, um, you've been around the Ledbetter Academy for over 20 years now at Champions Gate. You've worked with David for a number of years and, and not just with David, all of the coaches at the headquarters around the world. Um, and, you know, you've worked with players at all levels. You've played at all levels. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're, we're always in for a treat with you. You bring some fantastic insight, but more important to that, how are you doing at the moment? I'm doing great, Stuart, and welcome everybody who's actually uh, tuning in, seeing this live or seeing this recorded. Uh, we're going to talk about pressure, you know, really what it is, what it isn't. You know, we're going to take a look at sort of the, the big lies that some of the media, you know, talks about, you know, with pressure, uh, the distorted truth. You know, that everyone is cool, calm and confident coming down the stretch and they knew they had it all the time. We're going to talk about that. But I'm also going to talk about something I think that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And that is this whole notion about pressure. I mean, everyone feels it. No one is immune from it. And the game of golf is just almost tilted in the golf game's favor. It's almost like Las Vegas odds. So we're going to talk about how to deal with pressure, but uh, I digress a little bit because I really want to jump right into this, but I'm doing great. We've got a lot of people doing very, very well. Uh, myself, I continue to do all of my research here with the World Teaching Headquarters Academy, all of my clients here, but also at the same time, I've had a chance, you know, to actually play myself in USGA uh, local open qualifying and also USGA senior qualifying. So I've actually put myself, you know, in the fire. So I can tell you a little bit, not only just research, but a little bit of Dr. Bob Winter's me search, you know, how you know <laughs> I fared and how I did. And that's really why most of us psychologists, you know, get our PhDs and EDDs is that we really are interested in finding out how to actually figure things out, make ourselves better and help, you know, improve ourselves. And so we've been very, very busy and very fortunate. And uh, I always love to be on with you, my great friend. No, uh, Dr. Bob, thank you. Um, you know, it's a pleasure. And I think what you said there is that inquisitive mindset. I think that's something that is quite unique amongst the Ledbetter Academy instructors is we really share that inquisitive mindset. We're always looking to try and develop and improve um, and, you know, soak up knowledge from every every area we can, as, as they always say, every day is a school day. But you've talked about being back in the fall, playing a little bit. I can't believe you're playing seniors golf. Um, but it's one of those things. Yeah. Um, pressure, I think, from a player's perspective, I think as a coach, we'll, we know that we feel pressure in certain ways or we, we put pressure on ourselves. Um, you know, parents sometimes feel it and maybe administer stuff that makes the children feel a little bit under pressure. But Doc, what is pressure? You know, if I was to ask you straight out, Boy, you know, I was going to ask you, I was going to start off with you giving me your definition, but let's take a look at it from a Merriam-Webster dictionary physics definition. First of all, pressure is some force that is exerted from within, you know, something or some uh, object or, you know, externally, you know, compressed. And what that press, that force vector does, it distorts it you know, distributes you know, the, the matter, it squeezes, it makes it tight, it disfigures, and it takes it from its normal state of being and it does something to it. Now that's really what a physics definition of pressure is. But according to a great researcher by the name of Bowmeister back in 1984, he said that pressure, and I love this definition, it is a factor or any combination of factors that increases the importance of you wanting to perform well. And I've always loved that definition because there were a lot of different things he said. He said it was a factor. It could be one thing, or it could be a combination of things. And what happens is that when we start getting this combo plate 
of all of these different chemicals that's going on in our heads and all the different events and all of the different interpretations. And that's why this session is called the perception of pressure because different people feel different things about pressure. Some people thrive on pressure. Other people dive when pressure, you know, raises its ugly head. So do you thrive or do you dive? And so it's really how one sort of perceives you know, what we call the pressure. But the one thing that I can honestly say is that no one is immune from you know, the pitfalls of pressure. Everyone you know, fails at this game. Again, I said it was like earlier, like it's almost like the Las Vegas odds. If you ever go to Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, you see these great big, huge casinos. Now, they aren't being built there because everybody's coming in and winning, all right? Uh, the planes, you know, when they take off from Las Vegas, I've told, take off a lot quicker because they aren't weighed down with all that much money and all that much coin. They leave it right there in Las Vegas. That's why they have these bright lights. But I kept thinking about that. They have the house odds. In golf, golf has the house odds, meaning, you know, it's a tough game physically, psychologically, emotionally, even viscerally. I mean, we, we take it and we hurt. We really hurt a little bit when we come off the golf course and fail to play to our expected standard or maybe even our aspired uh, level of what we want to play. So, you know, they have, you know, the golf course, the way it's set up, the weather conditions. And so that's why I'm always trying to help my players say, listen, it's about you playing your ball and just playing it one shot at a time, trying to beat the golf course, because it is always your most, you know, strongest and most worthy adversary. And any break you get, you can't sit there and say, well, I really didn't deserve this break. No, you deserve every break and you need to take advantage of every opportunity. So when we start talking about pressure, I'm going to give you a little story about myself, you know, playing and trying to qualify for uh, USGA local open qualifying. Uh, I did it at a place that was pretty close to Champions Gate. It's called the Country Club of Winter Haven. And when I got my tee time from the United States Golf Association, it said we are starting at 910 on hole number 10. And it just so happens that hole number 10 at you know, Country Club of Winter Haven is the toughest starting hole. It is the number one handicap hole. It's about 465, 470 yards. Uh, you know, very kind of watered down the left side of the fairway, huge tree that you have to hit over. Uh, and then also it's maybe about a 215, 220 yard carry into a green that's protected by a pond, a moat in front. Now, when I saw that, and this is Dr. Bob Winters talking to everyone, not just Dr. Bob Winters, the sports psychologist, performance coach, but this is Bob Winters, the player. I'm sitting here going, wow, I'd much rather it started on number one, which is a nice 410 yard, kind of a comfortable little slight dog leg to the left starting hole. So two weeks before I actually you know, teed it up, I kept thinking to myself, wow, you know, I've got to really, you know, face this. I mean, I'm really, you know, the eye of the tiger right when you step up, you know, on the first tee. And so the big lie that, you know, I don't want anyone to think is that, yes, Dr. Bob Winters, yeah, you teach everybody, you know, these mentally emotional skills. You're cool, calm, and collected. Almost every night here for about two, three, four, five days before the tournament, before it actually, you know, started, I would be thinking about, that first hole. I would be thinking about that opening tee shot. I would be thinking about my strategy, about you know, what I was going to do. Was there apprehension here? Was there a feeling of uncertainty, of vulnerability? Now, I want to actually you know, say, yes, there was. And I had a kind of a hard time getting to sleep. The reason I want everybody to understand this, and it's coming you know, from the horse's mouth, is that no one is immune from this pressure. No matter how well prepared you are, I don't care if we're talking to Jack Nicholas, talking to Michael Jordan in basketball, or we're talking to the world famous Pele when he used to you know, talk about getting nauseous before he would go out and play huge soccer football matches. Everyone has this element of 
vulnerability, maybe a little bit of worry, a little bit of doubt. Now, what are you going to do with that worry? What are you going to do with that doubt? Well, I told myself, I know what I know. I know I have a great routine. I know that I can actually you know, get off to a good start. I know through years of experience, I have faced the same little menace every time. And I also happen to be a very passionate, you know, maybe even a little high strung golfer. So it, for me, I have to sort of take my emotional arousal level and sort of lower it. And we can talk everything you know, that most of these other people want to talk about intervention strategies, breathing strategies, meditation, Zen healing, all of that, you know, and God bless them. All right. I believe all of that. But one of the most important things you have to have is the philosophy that says, this is what I know I can do. And this is what I'm going to do. Now, as I walked up to the T, I had, you know, my wonderful friend, you know, Dave, Bosiga, who was on the bag for me, and he said, you've got this. And I said, well, we need to get off to a good start here. And so when they said my name from Orlando, Florida, Robert Winters, now on the tee, I had the opening tee ball. No one was in front of me. I stepped up there and I'm looking out and there's this huge sort of big oak tree that's maybe about 150, 200 yards out that you have to actually carry it. And there's really almost no way you can get around it. So I stepped up, went through my routine, did some nice, you know, little, you know, quick breaths, little, you know, uh, what we call synchronized breathing through the nose, bring it out and just kind of just right part of my sort of procedure. As I stepped in, I did one thing that I think is going to help everybody who's watching this, you know, program. As I stepped into the ball, I gave myself this directional silence. I just said, you know what to do. Let's go do it. And it was nothing that I had to tell myself other than you've got this. So I gave myself permission. I gave myself a free hall pass as we used to do in the old school days where you had to have the hall monitor, you had to have the hall pass. And so I told myself, let's do this. And I stepped up there and hit, you know, a really good drive, about 265, 270 yards. And the adrenaline kicked in and uh, I'm not the biggest guy, but I hit it very, very straight. Uh, and so I hit it, you know, right where I needed to. And that left me with about a 210, 215 yard shot into the hole, but the wind was coming into my face now. And I, so I took out, you know, a, a hybrid, a three hybrid, and I hit it and I hit it really, really well, but it bounced on the left side of the green and bounced over. Now at the opening first hole, US Open you know, qualifier, I had kind of a tough little pitch and the greens there were very, you know, rolling, very contoured. And so I stepped up, I did my rehearsals and I hit it and I hit it about, you know, six, seven inches from the hole. As I tapped in, I met my dragon. I slayed my dragon right there on the first hole. I had been carrying the weight of this one hole for seven to 10 days now. And I turned around and looked at my caddy, Dave, and I go, I don't care what the hell happens for the rest of the day. This right here for me was a real victory, a mini victory, because I had a lot more holes to play, but I actually you know, got through that. And I think it's really important for people to understand is that I've had so many players here, even this the last few days come to me and go, wow, I stepped up on this tee and I was so worried about what everybody was going to think. And was I going to embarrass myself? And I really wanted to score well. And I just, you know, am, am I, am I broken? You know, do I need to be fixed? I mean, they asked me these questions and I go, Welcome to the party, pal. I go, you have now joined, you know, the, the 28, the 30 to 40 million of people who are playing golf every day, and they feel just like you. And so let's not feel that this is a foreign phenomenon. I know everyone would say, boy, I want to play cool, calm, and collected. But that's really not the game because pressure, you know, in itself is really a good thing because it means that whatever you're doing, it has value to you. So when we talk about somebody, you know, well, you know, there's a big pressure shot. We can do two things. We could actually thrive or we can dive away from it. 
And I think that you and I were talking here earlier before we recorded is that you hear a lot of people say you need to embrace the pressure. And I don't want anyone to think that embracing the pressure means erasing the pressure because when something really means something to you, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, there, it's almost like indelible ink. It's right there. It just won't come out. Now we can try to, to erase it as much as we can and mask it. But when we embrace that pressure, what we're saying is it's energy. What am I going to do with this energy? Everything we have in our world is based on energy, you know, whether it's light energy, solar energy, heat, thermal energy, electromagnetic energy, everything around us, psychic energy. So if we can take that energy, you know, from sort of that nervousness, that anxiety, and sort of spin it a little bit and make it work for us, we could use that cortisol, that stress hormone, we can use the adrenaline, that stress hormone, and we could actually channel it, you know, to make us hit the ball further. In fact, that's what stress, you know, really does in the fight or flight or freeze response. It really sort of heightens our focus and makes us sort of hyper vigilant. So if we could just sort of kind of calm ourselves down a little, not a nice little breathing, but having a philosophy that says, I know what I know, you can kind of get through it pretty much, you know, like I got through, you know, my little mini dragon. And we went on, you know, to play and, you know, we, we played well, you know, it didn't make it, didn't make it through, but uh, we gave it a valiant effort. And so that's really a little bit of what we're going to talk here about today, Stuart. Yeah, Doc, as always, I think, you know, just the fact that you talked about your experience and it, it comes from kind of you and your heart, uh, I think it means so much and it really hits home a lot more than somebody just giving a presentation about something, for example. And I, I just love the way that you always deliver your kind of messages through your stories and it really hits home. And the big thing that I got from that, listening to it from a, a coaching point of view is, is really trying to be able to educate players about what pressure is. And like you say, pressure will be there because you care. You care about playing well. You want to do well. You want to exceed maybe your personal best, um, but you understand there's certain ways to do it for you as an individual. Um, I know for me as an individual, based on my personality, if I get into a, a position where I was coming down the stretch, I've got a couple of shot lead, my tendency would be to get very defensive because I'm quite prudent, I'm quite cautious, um, I'm quite, I'd be more strategic and thinking, oh, hold on, we've got a good round going here, let's let's not mess up, instead of saying, mm, sure. let's just keep, let's keep doing what we're doing to get to this situation, but it's natural personalities, and I think that's the, a real art of coaching as well, and whether it's working with a, a mental coach, a sports psychologist, or, or a coach that really understands this world, if they understand the player, they can really put some strategies in place to help them. And what you talked about, I thought really hit home for me that you had massive self-awareness. You talked about, you knew what you could achieve. You knew what you've done in the past successes. Uh, you knew what you needed to do to kind of, I guess, for want of a better word, you know, tackle the demons that could be there. Um, but you, you knew what to do to embrace the fact that you were starting on the difficult hall on the golf course. It was a tournament that meant something to you. Therefore, the pressure will be there because it means yes. something to you. Like you said, there's pressure on. Um, but you knew exactly what you needed to do. Now, I think obviously that's from a player's point of view. For the people watching this, that's great to understand to help their players. But one thing I'm always keen to get out of things is how can the coach develop some tools to relieve pressure for themselves in the coaching world? And from you, you've been involved in the coaching world for, for many a year and, and at all levels and been highly successful. What are some of the pressures that you've faced or what's your perception of pressure being in the coaching arena rather than the playing, or is it just the same? I think, you know, when you are a, a player, a scientist, a researcher, a coach, um, a confidant, 
a sounding board, you know, for a person that you're really wanting to, you know, for them to do well. Um, I think sometimes you have to, you know, maintain this level of objectivity because sometimes you want it for them and you want it so bad for them that almost you've got to make sure that you have clarity of, you know, are you really giving them what they need at that, you know, at that point in time? So uh, I'm sort of the, and I'm going to go back. We always talk about this under under the hat. This is under the hair. I always talk about the Vidal Sassoon, the great hair, the great hair guy. And he said, you know, and it was always funny. He always had that sort of motto. He goes, "If you don't look good, I don't look good." And, and one of the things, you know, that I've been, you know, very big on over these many many years, you know, that I've been involved in in sports psychology and performance enhancement, is that I wanted my players to know. That you know, I know sometimes people think I'm real positive and real blithe spirit and really you know easygoing, but I'm a pretty intense, very tenacious, tough teacher as well. I want them to know that if I'm going to commit to you, I want you to be a hundred percent committed to yourself and to the strategies that we're here, that we are mm -hmm. in this together. You just aren't out there alone. You may be me, my ball, and my target and me, myself, and I out there playing, but you've got your support team here that is actually, you know, really with you every stroke. Not to say that I'm living and dying, you know, on my athletes, but I want them to know, you know, that, hey, I do have expectations for them. I expect them to give, you know, their very best out there because I'm going to give them my very best in our meetings, you know, prior to, during, and even, you know, observing them. You know, so that's, that's sort of, you know, really, you know, what I, what I think about and for me, again, it's that passion, you know, of actually just going out there. And that's really why I even put myself in sort of in harm's way. And also, you know, mm -hmm. I say in harm's way, like, Ooh, because when we go to the golf course, there's two games that we can play. It's a fork in the road. Do we get our players and ourselves in this mindset that says, I'm going to go out and on this road, I'm going to go play as great as I possibly can. And I'm going to believe in myself all day. But here's where the doubt and the worry comes in. Because the doubt and the worry, they, it makes you a little emotionally frail. It makes you vulnerable. Because now there's an increase in this feeling of being vulnerable. And also a sense of, I'm not really totally in control. Now that's, you know, that's the doubt. So when we go out to play to play great, we're talking about playing with confidence, not playing with the expectations of score and results, but we're talking about playing with confidence, playing with trust and playing with grit and determination and, and the willpower to actually do the very best we can. But the problem is the road that's very often traveled is I'm really trying not to screw up at the same time. I don't want to damage my round. Uh, I, I really like to play good and I hope I play good. And that's sort of, you know, what we call sort of the, for lack of, a, lack of a better word, kind of a wanky hit and hope type, you know, mindset. And yeah. we got to make sure that we're not going down that road that we're always, always trying to push. Hey, you know, are you doing the very best that you can right now? So performance, you know, performance pressure is defined as an anxious desire to perform at this higher level in a given situation because it means something to you. There's this anxious desire. I really want to play well. This means something to me. And along with Bowmeister, his feeling is that this is a personally felt and it's very critically important event for me. So we have to understand that pressure, it comes along with this baggage called perceived value. And perceived value is, you know, sort of the implications that we put on this. This is really important to me. You see, because if it didn't matter to you, there wouldn't be this perception of pressure. You know, whatever. It doesn't mean anything. And that's why there's no consequences to it. But at the same time, when you go out and you go play, eh, there's no pressure. Have you really achieved anything? And see, that's the whole point about winning for me 
you know, and for my students, it isn't so much that we go out and we win this trophy, we win the outcome. You know, did we give a great effort? Did we actually fight off the demons of doubt and worry? Did we, you know, play with confidence? Did we actually allow ourselves and give ourselves permission to play with trust today? And I got to tell you, uh, as, you know, I was seeing a couple of weeks later after my, you know, USGA Open, that I went to the USGA Senior Open Qualifier down in Naples, Florida. I saw some different things and it was a different story about first tee anxiety and pressure. And I sort of want to relay this story to you. So uh, my lovely wife, uh, April, was caddying for me and she'd never caddied for me before and she did an awesome job. And so we got to the tee two groups early and we were sort of just sitting by the tee and just kind of you know, getting everything together and making sure, you know, I had my hands taped and everything was really ready to go and clubs, and everything was you know, set. And I took a look and they announced, you know, this gentleman on the tee. Now, again, I was on the number 10 tee teeing off and it was a short par four, very tricky, a lot of water in front, very narrow fairway. And a lot of people were hitting hybrids or three woods or and less than drivers very, very tight opening hole. And, and I embraced that. And I said, hey, been there, done that. You know, already just this two weeks ago. <laughs> so I, I thought, you know, the, the composure I gained through that, you know, recent exposure, and that's really a big thing we can talk about, you know, getting yourself prepared and getting yourself sort of those tournament sea legs. So I was watching this gentleman. I did not know his name, but he stepped up on the first tee. Yep. And he yanks it left out of bounds. And he just see, and he just he just dropped his head, shook his head, and so another guy stepped up and sort of kind of uh, wobbled it out there a little bit, but it was in the fairway, and another guy hit. So this gentleman he stepped up, you know, to hit, you know, his second ball. He moved it this far off the tee, and he chunked it right there off the tee, just boom. Now this player, I mean, I could see you know, he had a great practice swing. He just got overwhelmed. And he took his hybrid and actually almost hit his third shot out of bounds, you know, from, you know, from the tee box. Now, here's the point. And I know that many of our viewers are probably looking at this going, oh, my goodness gracious. Now what's going on in your mind? You're seeing someone just go left, right, boom. You know, it's just all over the place. How do you actually, whoop, you know, erase that from your mind? Well, again, that's almost like indelible ink, whoop. You know, it just sort of stays on your mind. And so there are a lot of people having trouble. So I actually stepped up on the T and I actually went through my focus. I actually blocked it out a little bit. And I, I really just got to be honest. You know, I really wasn't thinking about that guy. I had to get into my own little world. But it was a difficult mm -hmm. hole and I, and I stood on a little bit. We talk about pressure, how it makes you a little bit tight. And I remember asking Jack Nicholas years ago, when I was one of the Golden Bear mental game coaches at his Golden Bear tour. And we asked him directly, what is it that you do when you're feeling first T nerves or coming down the stretch pressure? What's one of the things that you do? And he said, I really want to make a full turn. He goes, Bob, that's the one thing. If I can make a full turn, because when we get you know tight, when we feel a lot of pressure, when it's a big shot, he goes, we want to steer it over control. So I'm just trying to give myself a lot of time he said, that's what a confident swing is. It allows you to make, you know, that full turn to give you the time to get all the synchrony together. And I thought about that. And I'll tell you what, easier to talk about, a little bit tougher to do. We know when you're right there on the needle. But, you know, I went ahead, you know, and really almost, you know, made birdie there on the first hole. And then, you know, the, the rest was history. But uh, as, you know, the round kept going on, the group in front of me, especially, you know, when we had, you know, to wait several times on the tee into tough driving holes. And that happens with a lot of players. You're going, wow, here it is. I you know I was into my rhythm. Now I'm on the tee. I almost have to start over again. And you're seeing everybody else, you know, hitting balls out of bounds and going left and going right. So it's really important that you can kind of get right here in your own little bubble and say, this is what I have to do. And I was pretty successful, you know, doing that, you know, for the full day. But 
those are just the things that you're going to face in these sort of what high value consequential rounds. You're going to have to learn how to deal effectively with the pressure and also have a philosophy about this is really what's important to me. This is what I know I can do. Because if we take a look at two or three of the world's greatest ever, Arnold Palmer, you know, what, what did he say when he was asked, you know, how do I deal with pressure? He said, I always go back to my basics. It always goes back to my basics. Jack said, I, I love the pressure. I, you know, I, I love it. He goes, Thursdays and Fridays are tough for me because eh, I'm just not into it. He goes, but I thrive on Saturdays and Sundays. He goes, mm -hmm. but I get prepared. And, you know, when I know I'm prepared, I don't really feel any pressure. And then you hear someone like Gary Player. He talks about the value of patience. Mm -hmm. And so just when John Rahm, okay, he just, you know, wins, okay, the championship, you know, fantastic U.S. Open champion. They asked him, you appeared so calm, John. You just look like you had it. And this is the whole, what I call the misperception, the false narrative, you know, from a lot of golf commentators, golf journalists. Oh, he knew he had it all the time. Even John, by his own admissions in the transcripts and the follow-up interviews goes, I may have appeared calm. I wasn't calm at all, but I really, you know, went to the very first tee and went to the very first toll. I did the same routine. I had the same, you know, rhythm. I tried to keep my tempo as well as I could up until the final hole there on 18. He goes, but don't think for a minute that I was cool, calm, and confident. That's all sort of a mask. But again, we learn to do that by vocational choice. A great LPGA professional by the name of Kelly Robbins said something, said one of the most eloquent things I've ever heard about dealing with pressure. She said, the reason we practice so hard and so long and so diligent is so that when we get into these tough and difficult pressure situations, we can handle them nicely. We put ourselves in that situation so many times before, we just you know kind of go on autopilot or at least the very best we can. I thought that was really you know one of the very best answers I'd ever heard. And so when we start talking about trying to erase, you know, what we're saying is we embrace the energy, embrace the notion that this is an opportunity. This is something that if I can do well here, this will be a springboard for me to build short-term, mid-term, and long-term confidence and self-efficacy. And I know you're going to be traveling here with, you know, the Women's Scottish, you know, national team. And you were talking about that, you know, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think exactly what you've just said there, Doc, is, you know, the, a lot of players build these bigger tournaments and they are bigger tournaments. They're kind of the major of the amateur world, if you like. And uh, sometimes players' expectations and their build-up gets kind of a little bit out of line to maybe what it really is. And, and they... They have that expectation that is way beyond where they probably are right now. But if they do what you've just said, like with Arnold, with uh, Gary, with Jack, with John Rahm, they've yeah. all found their individual ways to deal and coping strategies with these situations. Uh, and I think, you know, that's a big thing I've spoken a little bit with some of the players about is, you know, when you play well and you've played well under pressure, what have you done? And, and tapping in a little bit to say, well, that's all you need to really tap back into. It's, it's your process. It's your routine. At the end of the day, it's a golf course. It's got 18 tee boxes. It's got 18 greens. It's got 18 holes. The, the task at hand is the same. You realize and you accept the fact that the golf course will be set up by the green staff in, mm -hmm. in a little bit of a longer fashion. The greens will be set up a little bit faster. It's quite hard and bumpy at the moment in Northern Ireland. We've you know, it's not, we've not had loads of rain. Uh, it's getting to that time where the Lynx courses are firming up. 
and the chances are the pin position is going to be tucked a little bit. So you know that heading into the yeah. tournament. Uh, that's the reality of a of a high-profile amateur event, a high-profile professional event. And as we come to Sunday, the course gets set up a little bit more tricky. Um, but again, you've got to plan the golf course to suit your game and, and plan to your, play to your strengths. And I always think that's something that a lot of younger golfers they're, they're quite good at being aware of what they're good at. So they might go, listen, I'm a great driver of the ball. You said I hit it dead straight. Um, so you, you can stand with confidence on the tee and go, well, hey, if I miss the fairway, oh, that's a surprise. I don't normally do that. Um, right. and the, but the players, a lot of the time, get overwhelmed and start going, I don't want to go in the water. I don't want to hit it in that bunker. And I think sometimes right. as coaches, we can be guilty of saying... Ooh, this hole looks a little bit tricky, doesn't it? Ooh, <laughs> ooh, that bunker down there, we, we need to stay out of that bunker. And as soon as you start talking about what not to do and what not to try and achieve, it, instead of saying, hey, it would be great with your draw shot here if we teed it up on the left and aimed at that tree and you know, that'd be perfect for your shape and that'll just get you just down that left edge of the fairway at a perfect angle into the green. It's a very different way to frame your mapping of the course out, I guess. So the big thing for me with, you know, traveling with the team is they're all great players. They've all played really well to start the season in the first four or five events. A few of them have actually won. Uh, so they're in a great place with their game. They don't need technical advice, but I think they just need to feel as though, hey, that, I belong here. Um, I need to embrace this situation. You know, I, I kind of, it's mm. my time to shine. Um, and I think it's, it, it's about having belief, belief in themselves and belief as a team. Um, and I, I think if you look at what's coming up in the professional world, they've got the Irish Open this week, you've got the Scottish Open next week, and then you've got the Open Championship at Royal St George's the week after. So three weeks of pretty much links-ish golf. Um, and the media, as you alluded to, sometimes build these things up to be something that's maybe not, like you say, in oh, John Rahm's calm and collected. You don't know what's going on on the inside. And yeah, and that's and that's the one thing, you know, that all the commentators say, you know, here's, here's probably what he's thinking. And it may be something, you know, totally, you know, far, far removed, you know, from, from exactly that. But I really want to, you know, talk about just, just what you just said there just you know, a second ago and some really great thoughts is that what I'm always trying to help my players realize is that in the final analysis, it's still golf. If we could cut out all of this perceptual pressure fat and really get down to the very filet or the very lean part of this steak, which we call golf and say the golf ball only understands that when you find, you know, the best players in the world, they, they say, this is how I get ready for a big event. So uh, they'll say, I get there maybe a day or a couple of days before. I want to get all of my acquaintancing done, meaning, you know, all the starry eye, you know, hey, we're playing the USGA Open or playing the Open or we're playing the Scottish Open. I want to get all of that sort of out of the way. I just kind of want to say, okay, I've seen, you know, the, the nice you know, leaderboards. I've seen the tent city. I've seen all of that. Okay. It's a big thing. All right. But now when we get to the golf, you know, what are we going to do? Okay. I know there's going to be a lot of other players, but the one thing I'm always, you know, reminding players. And I remember Lee Trevino said it a long time ago when he went on to win the British open against Tony Jacklin. He said, somebody's got to win this tournament. Why not me? And I think that is the question we all have to ask ourselves. What, why not? Because most people go, why, why, why? And they just kind of have this whiny, like, why is this happening to me? And, and the ones that really go on to persevere and win, they go, why not? I mean, you know, I, I can play just as well as these guys. And I think that's really what this new generation of young talented players coming out of college coming up into the european you know the national and the usa ranks you know men and women you know we have actually you know trained them now to think 
hey, you have every bit of a chance. I mean, the golf ball doesn't know how experienced or how new you are. Let's go out and let's play. Let's beat the golf course and let's do it one shot at a time. And that gives them a present shot focus because what happens when people have a lot of pressure, it causes your mind to sort of wander and you project into the future about what could happen, what if this happens. And then we also sort of reflect into the past and go, oh, this happened and I damaged my round. But being in the moment, having an action plan, because action gets you through the fear. Now let's talk about that, you know, some real specific things you can think about. When you have the people who fear, who really get locked up, who get tight under pressure, they feel fear. And their fear, F-E-A-R, is that they are focusing all of their energy around the results. And it's a false expectation appearing real. Oh my gosh, I, I just don't feel good. You know, and they get very doubtful. They get very worried. They get very filled with vulnerability. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they say, I don't want to hit it in the water. And that's the ironic process theory. The irony is what you don't want to have happen, you almost create to happen. Okay. And the others who get out on the tee and go, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay here in this moment. I'm going to have an action plan for this shot. You know, and when you know we sit down with players, okay. Tell me three things that you want to do today. Three very specific task, process, focus goals. Very simple. This is what you're going to do. But also I'm reminding them, hey, you did great in these areas. You've been driving it well. You've been actually tapering. You've been peaking for this event for a long time. And there's no reason to think that whoop, it won't show up here today. And I always love, you know, the message of the miss, the message of the miss. What if a person says, what if I miss a shot? What if I pull one down the left side of the fairway? Well, that awareness of that mistake that you just made, it's a miss. Everyone's going to make you know that miss. But the message from that miss says, here's what I need to do to correct and to get myself back on track for the next shot. So, you know, that's a wonderful strategy, you know, that, you know, I, I will give, you know, Dr. Debbie Cruz, you know, a great credit for, because I've always loved some of the things that we have talked about. She was always talking about that message of the miss. And that's something, you know, that I will actually you know, relay on to our people is that if you have, you know, a mistake, turn it around, take it for what it was, it was a miss and turn it into some valuable feedback so that the next time you could have a feed forward mechanism that says, okay, yeah. I know this is what happened the last time. Here's what I need to do here. Even if you actually went and played a hole and you played a hole poorly yesterday and you step up on this tee, you don't want to be thinking, oh man, this hole's got my number. No, you want to be sitting there going, okay, I learned my lesson here from this hole yesterday. Here's what I want to do today. And this is what I'm going to do today. And when you have that action plan, the action plan takes fear and what it does, F-E-A-R, it focuses your energy around this resolute mindset. It focuses your energy around the routine. It says, this is how I'm going to get through that doubt. This is how I'm going to get through that pressure. And then when you have an action plan, here's like what happens to all that doubt and all that pressure. It dissolves it goes away. And that allows you to get in and do your directive. And people go, does that work? And I, I tell my, myself, the allies or anyone that goes into a hot zone, say Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, some of our soldiers, you know, and our allied forces in the USA, are they scared? Do they have fear? Yes, you know, when they go into, you know, Absolutely. a hot zone. They definitely have, you know, fear, but they also have a directive. They also have an action plan. They have a mission and a mission statement and a directive that says, this is what we're going to do. And they have trained themselves to actually be prepared for this. It's no different, you know, than, you know, an athletic performance, a golf performance. I know what to do. 
I know how to do it. And if I actually do these things, I can get it done. You know, and one of the things I, I wanted to read here to you, Stuart, uh, was something here that I've done a long time ago called the psychology of playing the game. And I had four different coaches and uh, one of them was Bobby Knight, you know, legendary coach, you know, basketball coach, who was a Pan American coach, the Olympic, you know, coach, coach at uh, Indiana University men's basketball team for many, many years, you know, a couple of NCAA championships. So they were playing at Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana against a rival a Purdue University. It was a real grudge match. Much like in soccer in England, it would be Liverpool playing Manchester United. You know, they really wanted to beat each other. So Purdue beats Indiana University. And Bobby Knight now is holding this press conference and he's saying, you know, to the press, and he's saying them, and I've said this for so many times, I even have to really look at it, but I'll look at it every now and then. He says, I don't give a damn what you guys say about it. But the reason we lost to Purdue tonight didn't have a damn thing to do with confidence. He goes, so you guys want to believe that crap? I don't care. Go ahead and write about it. You do anyway, but get this. The reason we failed is that we didn't execute. That's it and nothing more. Now, if we go out there and execute our game plan the way we've been going through it in practice, there's no way anybody can stay with us. If we execute, we produce. And if you can execute, you don't need to have confidence, momentum, or whatever. You are in control. We just didn't execute. And he goes on to say, if we can go out and control what we have to do, then we don't have to worry about what the other team is doing or is planning to do. And what I do with my players with this little sentence, I have them take out we and put I. And it says, if I can go out and control what I have to do, then I don't have to worry about what the other players are doing or what's going on outside of me. So Bobby Knight was talking about how do you deal with pressure? How do you deal you know, with the whole aspect of outcome, orientation, winning, and all of that? He just said three words, focus on execution. And I think that's you know, really how we actually deal most effectively with pressure. We have an action plan, we know what we're going to do, and we have to give ourselves permission to focus on what we know how to do, whether it's our basics, whether it's our fundamentals, or whether it's just us just freeing it up and saying, I've got this. But that's, I think that's how we deal with pressure. You, you got me scribbling about two pages of notes here, Doc, <laughs> but... Uh... but I know you, I've you been got pontificating me... a little bit. I'm so sorry, I didn't no, mean to go on so long. No. No, it's brilliant because it got, it got me thinking to some things that, you know, when I communicate with some of the players that I work with, and there's always that phrase, I have to hold this, I have to hit a shot down the middle, I, I need to play well this tournament, I've got to. And it's like, well, hold on, let's rephrase that and go, you get the chance or you have the opportunity now to strike one down the middle you have the opportunity to hold this four foot birdie putt to shoot 65 and your lowest shot ever. It's like, you have these opportunities, whether you, like you say, execute and it's successful at the end, um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. But if you focus on what you can control and go through the things that you know, help you as a player. And I think that's our duty of care as a coach with a player is to help them figure out what works for them, what their routine looks like, what their one shot at a time looks like. Yes, I mean, you talk a lot about um, the, you know, all the aspects that come into that one shot at a time, but each mm -hmm. player will be slightly different on how they handle it, how they gather their information, how they rehearse, then how they deal with kind of the execution and the acceptance and then how they take time out. Um, but I think that for me was a big thing that you're talking about. But then I think a lot of what you talked about there is that you talked about a player having a game plan and knowing what they're doing and being able to go execute. And I think that's what a lot of players miss. A lot of players do not understand what their game plan is. They go out hoping to play well 
but they don't really have a strategy in place that they know helps them. Um, mm. And I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but that's from my experience. I see a lot of amateur golfers that I would really question that they, do you have a strategy? Do you have a game plan? Do you know what you do on a regular basis? Um, or is it just a bit wishy-washy? Like you turned before, it's a bit kind of wanky. It's like here and there all the time. You know, and, and you being, you know, one of the best instructors in the world. I mean, one of the things, you know, that we're trying to do with our students is to get them to really understand what it is that they're doing, you know, at that moment in time. So, you know, I've always sat there and we're going out and doing on-course lessons. And I will ask, you know, one of my students, I don't care if they're a tour player, I don't care if a champions tour player or a junior player, I will always make them do public commitment. Public commitment to me is, what are you going to do with this shot? What do you see here? What are you going to do? And almost nine times out of 10, here's the answer I hear, you know, especially from younger players, college players, amateur players, they go, well, boy, I, I'd like to take this seven iron and kind of run it right up there that left hand side and hit it. I, I hope it can actually, you know, hit that side of the green. And I would sit there and I will stop them. I'm sitting here going, wow, there's a lot of weak motivational terms here. I hope, I try, tell me what you're going to do. Give yourself a direct order. This is your mind. You have to have, and I love what, you know, David said to me, you know, so many years ago, he goes, Bob, he goes, hey, we're trying to get this directed mindset, right? And I goes, exactly right. We're trying to direct our mind to tell our body, here's what I want to do with the shot. It's that directed focus. And that's why I say, when you step into the ball, when you know what you're going to do, you have directional silence. And so when you have this directional silence, you know what to do, you have the plan, and you've told yourself through private commitment, when I'm working with a player, we do public, I want them to, I want them to say it out loud. Yeah. Because there is no try, you either do it or you don't. And it's amazing how that conviction and that commitment, you know, and it just cuts through any of the doubt, any of the uncertainty, and it gives them a feeling of confidence and certitude. And I think, you know, that's really, you know, when, what would you tell, you know, all of our teachers who are watching, that would be the first thing is to make them, you know, tell you what's going on. And if they say, mm, I don't know, we say, then I don't want you to hit the shot then, because I want you to know exactly what it is you're going to do when you step in. I don't want you thinking about it when you're over the ball. That's really what directional silence is all about. You know what you're going to do. You know where it's going to go. Now just go and do it. And we know that through the pressure psychology research, the professional literature, is that you know, when things are really filled with pressure, we don't want you to you know, slow down. We don't want you to be conscious. We don't want you to be coercive. We want you to move through it. Let's go. Here, here's the answer. Just do it, you know, and get it done. That doesn't mean miss it quick. It means, you know, be thorough, be sure, and then step in and swing with as much confidence as you can muster. And that's how you get through those pressure situations. Yeah, I love the military analogy there, Doc, that you talked about. And it's it, so when you think about it, you know, nobody would say anything other. You'd say, well, if the military out there on an operation and they're, they're, they've got their mission, they've been told this is the directive, this is what you're doing, and here's what you need to do to execute this. And it's exactly what you've talked about with that directed mindset. And you go, well, we know that that's what the military do. We know that the, the US military and the, the British military are, are probably you know, two of the best militaries in the world. Um, and you, you go, well, they're successful at doing that. They know what they're doing. Uh, we need to take some of that into our into our sporting game, into our golf game, and it, it's just logical when you think about it. You talked a little bit about a miss. We know that not every shot's going to go in the hole, which would be a hundred percent success. It's it's unachievable sure. on certain shots. So success with the driver off the tee is not hauling it because it's a different objective. I always mm -hmm. like the way that you always talk about when putting is you know miss while you're trying to make. We know mm. the probability of hauling the putt 
is probably not going to be high. But as soon as we start thinking, oh, I'll just get this close. Well, now we're planning on missing. Why would we ever plan on missing the putt? Are we not, is the objective of the game not to make it? But being realistic enough that we know, hey, I did everything I could. I hit a great putt. I hit it at the speed I wanted. On the line I chose, it didn't go in. You can then, from the miss, have really constructive feedback. Did I strike it good? Yes. Did I hit it on the line I wanted? Yes. Did I hit it at the speed I wanted? Yes. Well, then I must have misread the putt. <laughs> and if, if one of the others was different, and you got those four simple things there, in, in my world of coaching, you go, you need that feedback. And, and I talk about that with the players. What, what is success for you when you're hitting a shot? It's not always the outcome. Yes, we'd love the outcome, but the outcome comes from the, the process. And you termed it before, you know, the execution, you know. But if your process yeah. is, is robust and you trust it and you're confident with it, the likelihood is you'll probably execute more often. But you know, I, I think there's some real golden nuggets in there in terms of what you've talked about. And kind of before we wrap things up, I know we're getting close to the hour here. I can one final question for you. Um, okay. I think a lot of players find it hard to create these pressure situations um, without being in a tournament. Can a player recreate the same type of pressures through their practice to prepare them for the tournament situations that they will face? Or will they simply gain experience by being in that tournament situation? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to let Michael Jordan, you know, speak for me. I'm going to read something here. Michael Jordan, who is one of the greatest basketball players ever, if not the greatest, he said, people didn't believe me when I told them I practiced harder, much harder in practice than when I played in games, but it was true. You know, it was in practice under these tough, tough practice, you know, conditions where my comfort zone was created. By the time the real game came around, all I had to do was react to what my body was already accustomed to doing. Now that's, that's the great Michael Jordan talking about that. And so the point of it is that we know through the professional research is that the more times you put yourself in any type of level of stress, moderate stress, you know, mild stress, even severe types of stress, and you become desensitized to that or acclimated to that. We talk about this repeated exposure breeds athletic composure. And there is no substitute, you know, for tournament competition to say that, you know, can we recreate, you know, something that is, is like uh, coming down the stretch, you know, of my club championship. I, I, I'm not really sure if we can, but we can get pretty darn close because when you're going to actually do performance situations, much like, you know, for us taking an SAT test or achievement test, GRE, medical test, LSAT, we take these performed time tests, these standardized tests. We put ourselves under sort of the grind. So the same thing, we can go out and we can go actually play 18 holes. But instead of actually hitting a ball down the middle and playing and getting the ball, you know, nice and nice lie, we play tough lies tough situations. We actually make it as hard for us out there as we possibly can so that when we get to the tournament, you know, even if we have, you know, these tough options, we go, ah, no big deal. I'm, I'm ready for this. Again, it's all that matter of preparation. The other part of it is, and I've taken this to maybe over 150 colleges over these many years, is what I call this drill that just goes out seven or eight steps off the green. You take one ball, and you go out to 10 different spots around the green. Your task is to get that ball. I mean, not from 30, 40 yards. I'm talking just off the green where the ball wants to sit down in the, you know, the nappy lies, you know, the stinker lies, what I call them. And they're the, the little stinker, little skunk lies where the ball kind of sits in, sits half out. If you can get those up and down, you know, nine out of 10 times, you know, and me par is two on every 10, so par is 20. If you can get to a score of 22, 23, you have to go out and put it up. If you can do that, that is a real good transfer element. 
because you can't sit there and say, I'm just going to train. Now I'm going to go play and I'm going to trust. I've, I've never liked that. I've always wanted that bridge, that transfer bridge. We're going to actually transfer and we're going to trust our training. So now when we get out to go play, we've already trained ourselves to trust here. So when we go out, we're just going to go play. And that's why I've always, you know, made my practice rounds long before, you know, I, I knew, you know, heard of Michael Jordan, you know, when I was younger, I made it, you know, really tough. I played from tough situations, created as many scenarios, created as many different options for different shots that I had to hit. Because like Ben Hogan once said, there's not enough hours in the day to practice all the shots that you'll probably face in a tournament. And, and if you have, you know, sort of that type of a mindset, you should be, you know, fully well prepared to go play in a tournament because you know you've done everything you possibly can. But in the final, final analysis, we talked about the belief system. You've got to step up on that tee and you have to say, I've done, you know, the very best I could to prepare. Now I'm going to give myself permission and believe in my talent and let it come forth. And to me, that is the greatest gift any golfer can give themselves is to free their mind and let themselves just perform the way that they know they can. Because the greatest fear, I think, that almost all great players have is that they fear that they won't be able to access the talent that they know they've been practicing so hard for because they get in their way because of the doubt and the pressure. So let's get through the doubt, get through the pressure, embrace it, not try to erase it, use that energy, and let's go play the very best that we can. Doc, fantastic advice as always. Um, and again, so gracious with your time. A lot of what you talked about there, I, I was party and, and proud to help you develop your tournament thoughts for great golf uh, course that sits within our university platform. And, um, you know, that was a, a 13 chapter audio um, course that has so many embedded messages in there, but a lot mm. of what you've talked about tonight is addressed in each of those chapters about getting ready to get to the first tee, you know, allowing yourself permission to go play, uh, accepting the results, you know, and all of those different chapters, right the way from, you know, starting to practice, to getting to the golf course, to registering, to teeing off, to getting into your round, to closing it out, coming down the stretch, and then to the post round reflection. So anybody listening to this, head on over to app.ledbetter.com, check out Tournament Thoughts for Great Golf with Dr. Bob here. Um, you will not be disappointed in the information. Whether and I can it's tell you... Yeah, I can tell you, Stuart, that I actually listened to that. And after, you know, that first tee shot, as I'm walking down the fairway, I'm thinking to myself, hey, my audios really do work. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I knew that, you know, I just, I just knew it because, you know, so, so many times, and I think that's the whole notion about everyone saying, oh, you're an expert, is that you still have to be able to perform, no matter how great your expertise is, you still have to go out and do it. So that's the great thing. Yes, you know, tournament thoughts, you know, for great thoughts, you know, thank you. You know, you, you did a, a great job, you know, helping me with that. And I hope everybody, you know, goes and, and, and buys it and actually listens to it because it will really help you and it will help you deal with the demons of pressure so you can go out and perform, you know, your very best. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to put a personal testimonial on that. No, no, Doc, it's a fantastic course. And as always, you you care immensely about what you do. That's evident in the passion that you have when you talk and how you become animated. And you can see that you just care immensely about this topic. Um, and, you know, we've, we've unearthed a few topics together with you and you've always been so kind to come on under the hat and virtually you know, a lot of chats with us, with our instructors and our virtual summit as well. So we're always thankful not only for, for what you bring to 
to the table, but for your continued support to everything that we do. Um, and yeah, on behalf of everybody that's uh, watching and will watch this, uh, we'd like to thank you for your time, Doc. And uh, thank you for, for listening, all of you listeners out there. And uh, like we were saying, app.ledbetter.com, tournament thoughts for great golf. You will not be disappointed. So check it out and uh, we'll see you next week on Under the Hat. Thank you, Doc. Thank you.